this time I would like to ask Mr. Shackett to please come to the podium. <laughs> Morning, Baker. Thank you, Andrew. I gotta say, I was a little uh, surprised when uh, you guys elected me to be the class speaker this year. Um, I was surprised for two reasons. First, I was told you wanted a speech of no more than 10 minutes. How many of you have been in my class? <laughs> Joke's on you, I don't do 10 minutes, people. <laughs> Buckle up, snowflakes, we're here for a while. <laughs> second reason I was surprised is I'm sort of known for a tendency to say rude, crass, perhaps even offensive things in the course of my teaching. I lack a filter, I venture off into questionable tangents, invent curious analogies to make my point. So I can only assume that you asked me to speak as some sort of test of my self-discipline. See if I can do this without getting fired. If this, is the case, if this is the case, then the joke is probably on me. In all seriousness, I'm really honored to speak with you today. In the few short minutes I have, I want to leave you with a few, what I believe to be very important challenges. But first, a question. How many French soldiers does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> just kidding, I'm just kidding. You're not fully aware of this yet, but the next 40 to 50 years of your life is going to be devoted to work. <laughs> You're going to be committing yourself to what most in the audience and up here on the stage already know all too well. It's called the daily grind. The day in, day out routines of life. Get up, shower, fight traffic driving to work, a full day doing your job, get back in the car, fight traffic driving home, make dinner, fold laundry, go to bed. And then do it again. It's depressing, isn't it? Actually, it doesn't have to be depressing at all if, and here's my first challenge to you, you intentionally choose vocations that bring you a sense of purpose, pride in what you do, and satisfaction. Listen, if you're simply out for a job and a paycheck, you're going to find that. If you choose a vocation because it's what's expected of you, or because it represents what society holds up, you're going to be okay. You might even be successful. But your life is going to be the daily grind because it won't bring you the internal rewards that sustain one's soul. Americans have this annoying penchant for ranking and sorting everything and assigning value based on two factors, income and prestige. You know what I'm talking about. A doctor's better than a lawyer. No, wrong. A doctor's better and more important than a construction worker, a hedge fund manager is better than a fast food worker. In this calculation, the Kardashians kick all of our butts, <laughs> though nobody can articulate why. But the reality is that nearly every vocation is important and is necessary to the functioning of our society. And it's going to matter a great deal to the lives and experiences of the 300 million people who live here. Now I say nearly every vocation is important, because listen, if you're going to be a drug dealer, get alive. Don't do that. A number of years ago, I had a brief experience with an airport sandwich maker that has stuck with me in the years since. I was at the airport pick up my mom, who I hadn't seen in a while, so I was pretty excited to see her. Out through the secure area she comes, we hug, we hug, and then she immediately exclaims, I'm starving! In that tone of voice that makes you know, you better feed the woman now or you're going to have to leave the old bat on the side of the highway. <laughs> so we decided to eat at the airport. This was a small Midwestern airport, it's not DIA, so our options for eating were slim. My mom decided she wanted a handmade sandwich from a small deli counter in the food court, and I opted for pizza. I got my lunch, I sat down at the table and ate it, thinking my mom will just be over in a couple of minutes. Ten minutes later, she still hadn't joined me. I look over at the deli counter, and I notice that she's still in line, and she's the only one in line. So I was annoyed. I got up, I walked over to the deli counter, was about to say something very typically me, you can use your imagination. When I heard the conversation that the woman making my mom's sandwich, we'll call her Jane, and my mom were having, Jane was beaming with pride about the sandwiches she made, saying she's the best sandwich maker around, and that nothing made her happier than providing tired travelers with a good, satisfying meal. She spoke about teams of pilots that regularly came through that airport who would only eat at her counter. She lit up as she told my mom how much it meant to her that these pilots came to see and talk with her as they enjoyed her artistry. I remember her saying, I know I only make sandwiches, but I love to do it. And I love the smile I put on people's faces. 
and I want to think I bring something to their day. Jane made sandwiches. I doubt she made much money, and her vocation absolutely is not something our society ascribes a whole lot of value to. But I remember being struck by the sense of pride and satisfaction with which Jane spoke about her work. I remember the way in which she described her work as a way to serve others, and the impact she thought was she was having. And you know what? I have no doubt she did have that impact. Aristotle said, where the needs of the world and your talents cross, there lies your vocation. The world needs sandwich makers and doctors. It needs plumbers and CEOs. It needs mechanics and construction workers and trash collectors every bit as much as it needs investment bankers and entrepreneurs and lawyers, though I probably think we could do with a few less of those. <laughs> Everybody has a role to play, and every role, if carried out with pride and passion and a sense of purpose, is important. And what you do is going to be meaningful to the lives of those around you, and don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. Raise your hand. Who here plans a career in medicine or engineering? Thank you. You are going to do important and meaningful work. Who here wants to enter a trade, maybe an electrician or plumber or construction? Thank you. You're going to do important, meaningful work. Who's entering the military? Thank you. You're going to do important and meaningful work. Anyone want to be a teacher? Thank you. You're going to do... Well, actually, you'll be to blame for everything. Particularly if you teach AP U.S. history. Find meaningful work and throw yourself into it like Jane, and by all means, be effective. My second challenge to you is simple. Be men and women who care about and stand for things that are larger than yourself. Now I say this is simple, but it's not. In fact, you guys are coming of age at a time when it may be harder than ever. Like this, share, retweet that, do whatever it is you do on Snapchat. By the way, stop Snapchatting, it's creepy. I'm serious, nothing good comes of a text or a picture that disappears off your phone in 10 seconds. My point is that social media and the modern game of branding oneself as though you're a product means that it's easy to look like you stand for something, maybe stand for everything, but not actually stand for anything at all. It's okay to care about things and to stand for causes and ideas that are important to you. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect in your defense of them or even right all the time. It doesn't mean you get to diminish the causes and principles and passions of another in order to uphold and advance yours. And it doesn't mean you can't compromise in order to see done in this world the things you want to see done. As you go through the next years of your life, decide what's important to you and then do the best you can to orient your life and your actions towards those things. And listen, standing for something can be terribly difficult. You're going to be ridiculed, you're going to be mocked, you're going to be targeted, you're going to be told how wrong you are or how simple-minded. And it requires taking risks. This year I feel like you got a decent model and the teachers who sit with you today. On September 29th, nearly all of us were <coughs> sick. You don't have to agree with what we did, and lots in the audience and up on this stage don't agree with what we did. But we stood together for things that were important and meaningful to us. We risked, and we rolled with the punches that came. Be willing. Be willing to take risks. Be willing to endure the ridicule. Stand for something. My favorite sentence in the Declaration of Independence is not what most Americans today connect with. Most of us latch onto that famous line, we hold these truths to be self-evident. I'm a fan of the Declaration's very last sentence, and I want you to listen to this. And for the support of this Declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. What's with your, worth your fortune? What will be worth your sacred honor? Decide, and then stand for it. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. This time I want to introduce our principal, Mr. Brian Conroy.